Well, good morning, everybody. Can y'all hear me okay? I'm not over over mic, am I? Perfect. That there. Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Helen. And it is a joy to be with y'all this morning at Journey Community Church. Um, I have enjoyed getting to know Pastor Dave and Helen the past several months. Um, my wife has worked at the same school that Helen has. Um, so there's a natural connection there. And then as we started our journey of church planning, I have drawn so much inspiration and encouragement from Pastor Dave and from the journey, no pun intended, of Journey Community Church. So I was honored to be invited and it is a great privilege to get to be with you this morning and to open up the word together. Our preaching text this morning is uh, John chapter 20. And we're going to be in verses 19 through 29. So I invite you, if you have your Bibles, to open up there with me. John 20, verses 19 through 29. So hear hear this from God's word. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is God's word. Every word of it is true and it is given for our instruction. And so let me pray for us as we begin. Jesus, thank you for this passage. Thank you that you have not hidden yourself from us. You have revealed yourself to us in your word. And so, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts this morning would be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, last year, 2023, marked the 60th year anniversary of the death of the Christian author C.S. Lewis. I don't know about you, I'm a a big fan, so I'm sure some of you have, have read him. Uh, And when we think about the legacy of C.S. Lewis, the first thing that comes to mind for many of us is his legacy as a Christian apologist, right? He was a spokesman and a defender of the truths of Christianity. When you take stock of the 20th century, Lewis did arguably more than any other Christian um, to gain a public hearing for Christianity in the public square. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, which were an allegory in a lot of ways of the gospel story. Um, He gave rousing wartime broadcasts on the BBC airwaves, which became mere Christianity. And his books have sold over 200 million copies, which is a whole lot. But long before C.S. Lewis became a giant of the faith, he was a very different sort of man. Lewis was a doubter. He actually spent a significant portion of his adult life into his late 20s as a skeptic and even a, a critic of Christianity. And he has a book, Surprised by Joy. Maybe some of you have read it. It's kind of like his spiritual autobiography. But he shares here that his journey into faith, it was winding. It it was not at all a straight linear path. There were a lot of speed bumps and diversions along the way. And when when Lewis finally came to faith, it was anything but uh, triumphal. He, He writes this. He says, alone in that room in my college at Oxford, night after night, that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me in the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and I admitted that God was God. And I knelt and prayed perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Now I I open with this story this morning because our gospel text 
uh, introduces us to another famous skeptic turned believer. This is the apostle Thomas. And there's a resonance, I think, between the stories of these two men, between Lewis's journey into faith and Thomas's. If Lewis was the most reluctant convert in all of England, I think we can say that Thomas was the most reluctant convert in all of Judea. And I know that here at Journey Church, Journey Community Church, you've recently wrapped up a Holy Week uh, sermon series about the events of that week and the resurrection. And that now you're in a sermon series on faith in the book of Hebrews. And so my hope is that, you know, Pastor Dave said, preach on anything you want, Matt. My hope is that today's text ties in well with those themes, the, the truth of the resurrection and also the nature of true faith. So, so here's our roadmap for this morning. We're going to work our way through that passage. So keep your Bibles out. And first, we're going to look at Thomas's doubt to see what does it teach us about how to handle doubt when it arises in our life and also how not to handle it. And then secondly, we're going to look at Thomas's faith to see what it can teach us about the nature of true and authentic and God honoring faith. So first, setting the stage for our passage, where are we in John's gospel? Well, at this point in John, Thomas and all the other disciples, they've spent three years following Jesus as his handpicked disciples all over ancient Palestine. Um, And Thomas has left everything. He's left everything to follow this rabbi from Nazareth. He's left his hometown, his career, his family, everything is behind. And while that's certainly a high cost, we can imagine that Thomas I mean, what a consolation to get to be with Jesus, right? To see the miracles firsthand, to hear his teaching, to know his voice. And so I think it's impossible to overstate or to to really fathom how defeated Thomas must have felt to see Jesus die an unceremonious death on a cross. Thomas had staked his hope in life that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was God's anointed one. And so how crushing must it have been when he saw Jesus not end his life with triumph, but die on a cross. This was the, the curse of Deuteronomy 6.4. Thomas knew his Bible and Deuteronomy 6.4 said, Cursed be everyone who is hung on a tree. So you see, Thomas's doubt, it doesn't come out of a vacuum. It, it doesn't emerge out of thin air. It doesn't come out of left field. It begins in this storm of life that comes over him. The storm of an abrupt change of circumstances. The storm of all his hopes in life being dashed, the storm of his expectations for how his life was going to turn out, all of a sudden being pulled out from under his feet. And I think there's an application for us here, isn't there? I don't know about you, but often it's relatively smooth sailing in our discipleship and our faith when everything is going pretty well in life. There's cost, there's sacrifice involved in following Jesus for sure all the time, but it's not so hard to praise the name of Jesus when everything in our lives is going pretty well. You know, I got a 4.0 this semester, praise God, right? I have a steady job. I just got a promotion. Thank you, Lord. It's easier to say those things when things in life are going well. But then I'm sure we've all experienced it in different forms. A major storm comes up in our life. Maybe we failed a class and our GPA plummets. Or maybe that stable job you thought you had, there's economic downturn, there's layoffs, and all of a sudden you're staring down unemployment. Maybe it was a diagnosis. Maybe you go through a breakup in a dating relationship. Whatever it was, doubt or questioning God's goodness and his character, it often originates in life storms like these. And we're forced to to grapple with some pretty deep existential questions. Is God really who the Bible says he is? Is God really sovereignly in control of my life? And if he is in control, then why would he let my life turn out like this? If God is in control and he let this happen, is he really good? Can I really trust him? Can I really hand my life over to him? Thomas's doubt, it originates in this storm, the storm of all storms. Jesus has died. His hopes in life are dashed. But the question becomes, you know, what does Thomas do with this doubt? He faces it, it overcomes him, but what does he do with it? Well, immediately before our passage, we're told, or in our passage, the first part I read, we see that Jesus has risen. There's victory. He has risen from the grave and he's appeared to 10 of the disciples. The natural question there is, I thought there were 12 disciples. What about the other two? Well, Judas at this point has taken his own life. Where's Thomas? Thomas is the one missing here. Verse 24 from our text. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. When you read other Christians throughout the ages who have commentated on this passage, they observed that this was not simply bad timing on the part of Thomas. 
Thomas did not just have bad luck. He was not just out on a lunch break. Oh, I missed him. You know, when Jesus came, he has intentionally separated himself from his brother apostles here. So Judas betrayed the 12, but Thomas appears to have abandoned the 12. This is like an athlete who doesn't like the way that the season's going. And he cleans out his locker in the dead of night and quits the team in the middle of the season, right? Abandoning his teammates. So Thomas's doubt, it began earnestly in a storm. It's understandable in some respects, but it quickly progresses into this dangerous spiritual territory of isolation. So Thomas has removed himself from the community. He's now shunning his friends. He's forsaken the Sunday assembly. They're all gathered. He's not there. And Thomas, therefore, was marked absent from the very first Easter Sunday worship gathering. Now, look, it would be easy to beat up on Thomas here. Maybe it sounds like I am beating up on Thomas. But I think we can recognize this temptation in ourselves, can't we? Often, when a major storm comes in our life, it allows doubt or questioning God's character and his goodness to gain a foothold in our life. And then what do we do with that? One thing that we can be prone to do is to um, isolate ourselves to make that a private internal struggle that we hide and we don't let others into. And as a result, spiritual isolation, it becomes this breeding ground for doubt to grow and spread in our life. Like you think about the way mold grows in a dark, damp, closed off environment, right? If you, if you shed in light, mold can't grow. But if you close things off and you keep it damp, it, it's an environment that mold can grow in. That's like the way faith, or that's like the way doubt can, can work when we don't open up to others and let them in. So this raises the question, what's the antidote to this? Is there another path that we can take? What do we do when we have questions about God, when we're struggling in our faith, when we don't know what to do with our doubt? Well, thankfully, Scripture does give us another path other than the one Thomas takes here. You can see this path in Psalm 73. So if you have your Bibles, I'll actually invite you to reference that text also. Um, Psalm 73 is not a Psalm of David. This is actually by a lesser known man named Asaph who was part of the the temple courts. Um, And in this psalm, Asaph tells us about this dark night of the soul that he's going through. He is also facing one of life's storms. And in Psalm 73, he cries out to God. He says, why do the wicked prosper and live at ease while the righteous suffer and live in want? He gives voice to his doubt in verse 13. That's the key verse. He says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean. So Asaph, he's got the same problem as Thomas. He's wrestling with doubt. He's struggling. He's questioning God's goodness. And he could have kept those doubts hidden to himself, you know, hidden to the privacy and isolation of his own soul, but he doesn't do this. He shows us a better way. Look at verse 16 in Psalm 73. Asaph writes this. He says, when I thought how to understand this, in other words, I'm struggling with doubt. I'm vexed. And when I try to understand things, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. So Asaph, he takes doubt where it belongs. This is Old Testament. He takes doubt to the temple. He takes it to the assembly of God's people in worship. And there his doubt is reframed. There his circumstances are all of a sudden cast in a different light. There he is reminded of all the truths that he's prone to forgetting. There his current feelings towards God, they yield to an eternal perspective of who God really is and what he's done for him. Friends, God can stomach our doubt. He is a big God. He can handle our doubts when we, when we have them. After all, sentiments of doubt, they're inscribed into God's holy word. You see them there in Psalm 73. They're part of the canon. But it's all about what do you do with it? What do you do with your doubt? Do you give into it? Do you isolate? Do you let your doubts kind of grow and win out? Or do you take them to the right place, which is to a church, to a community group? to coffee with a friend, to Pastor Dave, and not leave them in the isolation of your own hearts. And so if you're here today and you're someone who is struggling with doubts of any kind, maybe they're intellectual doubts about the faith, maybe they're existential personal questions about God's goodness, I just want to encourage you, don't wait until you've got it all figured out to plug into a Christian community. Bring the doubts with you. Come to church, join a community group, um, bring your doubt with you and air it out in the light of the community. So Thomas's doubt, it began with a storm, which then progresses to isolation, and it finds full form in verse 25. So now we're jumping back to uh, John 20, verse 25. So the other disciples, they have seen Jesus, and they come looking for Thomas to share the good news with them. They say, Jesus is risen. We've seen him. 
And Thomas's response here is shocking in how forceful it is. Look at what he says. Thomas says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, so unless my sense of sight is satisfied, and unless I place my finger into the mark of the nails, unless my sense of touch with one finger is satisfied, and unless I place my hand into his side, so unless my sense of touch with my entire hand is satisfied, Thomas says, I will never believe. That phrase, I will never believe, it's actually, it's a double negative in Greek, which is kind of like an exclamation mark in Greek. Emphasis on never. I will never believe, Thomas says. So Thomas's response here is breathtaking in its boldness. This is classic spiritual bargaining. It's placing conditions on God that he must meet before we'll give our lives to him, before we'll put our faith in him. One commentator on this passage writes, no skepticism could be more thoroughgoing than this. Nobody else in the entire New Testament makes demands like these before believing in Jesus. Well, that may be true. Maybe no one else in the New Testament does this, but can't we recognize ourselves in Thomas here? How many of us have not felt at one point or another, you know, God, if you would just answer this prayer, this thing I really want, then I would be able to trust you more, right? Right? God, I've gotten myself in a pickle here. I really need your help. If you'll just get me through this one crisis I'm in, then I'll finally surrender that area of my life that I've been holding back from you. God, if you would only give me a sign, then I would have such an easier time putting my faith in you and believing in you. We've all been there at one point or another, haven't we? Like Thomas, we've been tempted to place an onus on God. For him to acquit himself of our doubts, we demand that he give us what we want and satisfy our conditions. Well, doubt doesn't have to take this form. Doubt in and of itself, again, it's natural. It's not an altogether bad thing. Um, I've worked in college ministry for the past eight years. I'm all the time meeting with students who have questions. It's often not a bad thing. When you grapple with your questions in a healthy way, it can actually lead you to a deeper and more resilient faith and a more profound joy in Christ. But it's all about the right posture. It's all about what do you do with your doubt? We need to follow the path of Asaph. Lord, here are my doubts. I'm voicing them to you honestly, but now I'm taking them to the sanctuary. I'm taking them to God's people. The right posture is also provided by the father of the demon-possessed boy in Mark's gospel. Do you remember him? He says, Lord Jesus, I believe, no conditions. And then he prays, now help my unbelief. That's an earnest prayer, right? I believe you without conditions, but I'm still struggling. So please help me in my unbelief. Doubt is still there in both instances, in Asaph and in the father of the demon-possessed boy. But unlike Thomas, these are healthy ways to process your doubts. Bring them to the Lord and bring them to the Lord's people. So we've looked at Thomas's doubt, but now let's, let's keep reading and transition to our second and final point. So Thomas is still a skeptic of the resurrection at this point in verse 25, but he does take an important step. Look at verse 26. We're told that he rejoins the apostles for their gathering the next Sunday. So he's abandoned the community at first. Now he's rejoined the community. And it's through taking that initial step that something incredible happens. We're told, although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So Thomas here, he encounters the risen Lord Jesus in the flesh. He is confronted with overwhelming evidence that his doubt was misplaced. It was in error. It was wrong. And Jesus has indeed risen from the dead. The resurrection is true. And this highlights another crucial application for us, which is that faith in the resurrection is sound. You can stake your life on it. It will stand up to the most ardent scrutiny that you can subject it to. So faith in Jesus, I I have this conversation with college students all the time. It is not an anti-intellectual, bury your head in the sand, turn off your brain, move. It does not run contrary to all evidence and reason. If you can get past the initial stumbling block of miracles, if you can accept, point one, that God is creator of everything that exists, it's his universe, it's his world, and therefore he has supernatural power within it. If you can get past miracles, then there is a mountain of evidence for the truth of the resurrection. Let me share just two two strands of it with you this morning. Um, There's dozens we could go through, but we're just going to highlight two. First is the testimony of the women. So all four of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all explicitly claim that the women were the first ones to see Jesus uh, when he rose from the dead. Why is that significant? 
It's significant because in this cultural context, women were not considered to be credible eyewitnesses. Josephus was a first century historian. He was a a contemporary almost of Jesus, lived just a few years after him. And he wrote this expressing the standard view of the day. He said, from women, let no evidence be accepted because of the levity and the boldness of their sex. Now we hear that and we cringe at it, right? But that was the view of the time. And therefore, if you were Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and you were writing a gospel and you were trying to invent a legend or a fable about a resurrection, you would never, ever put women as the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection. The only reason you would put that in your gospel is because you felt constrained by the truth, because you had to report what actually happened, because Jesus actually walked out of the tomb, and because the first people who he encountered were the women. That's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us this. But some people will say, I've heard this from students, isn't it true that the gospels are written 30 or 40 years after the events that they describe? Isn't that an uncomfortably long gap between the events taking place and then the recording of them written down? Well, let's grant that point for the sake of argument just for a second. And then I would invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. This is a letter written by Paul much earlier. This is 1 Corinthians is only written 20, maybe 25 years after the resurrection. And in chapter 15, Paul writes this. He says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. What's so significant about that verse is that Paul did not come up with this language himself. Paul is actually, he tells us that he received it. And what most New Testament scholars believe is that this was an early Christian confession of faith. It was like a creed that all the Christians knew and they would recite together. Paul has received it from the other apostles. He's passing it along to the church at Corinth. And what's so significant about this, one New Testament scholar writes, we can be entirely confident that this statement was formulated within months of Jesus' death. So in other words, the resurrection, it's, there's no 30 or 40 year gap between the event taking place and it being written down in the gospels. It was recorded and recited and transmitted in this form of a creed or a confession of faith within months of his death. And then 1 Corinthians 15, it goes on, it name drops, it name drops the sources. Paul tells us, Jesus appeared to Cephas, the 12, James, all the apostles, and more than 500, most of whom are still alive today. This is like an ancient footnote. He's telling you who his sources are. He's saying, look, if you doubt the truth of the resurrection, here are several eyewitnesses, go ask them. Go ask them what they saw. Now, these are just two among, again, dozens of compelling strands of evidence that support the truth of the resurrection. Why did these monotheistic Jews who believed in the oneness of God all of a sudden start worshiping Jesus as one and the same with the God of Israel? Why did these Jews who practice the Sabbath of Friday night through Saturday all of a sudden stop worshiping then and begin worshiping on Sunday, the day of the resurrection, and they stop attending temple and they start worshiping in house churches? You know, the resurrection, it's a one-time historical event. It's not something that you can prove to someone like you can through a science experiment or a, a mathematical theorem or something like that. But there is a mountain of evidence. The case for it is strong. Jesus really walked out of the grave. It really happened. So Thomas, his initial uncertainty in our passage, it yields to the undeniability of the resurrection. He's confronted. He sees Jesus is risen. And if you relate to Thomas and his doubts about the resurrection, I want to invite you to explore the claims for it. Do your homework, read up on the arguments, uh, subject it to scrutiny. And like Thomas, you also might be overwhelmed by what you find. The second thing that Thomas teaches us about faith, this is our final point, is the form of true faith. So Thomas's confession of faith at the end of our passage, it becomes a template for all future Christians of what real sincere faith looks like. There, there's great irony, I think, that Thomas becomes known as Doubting Thomas, right? That's his nickname. That's how we know him, Doubting Thomas, as if that was his static and fossilized identity for all time. But step back for a moment and consider with me the role that Thomas plays in the overarching story of John's gospel. So John's gospel, you know, it begins with a bang. You've got the famous prologue at the beginning, Right. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. So you, the reader, you pick up John, you start reading. Within the first 18 verses, you already know who Jesus is. He is the cosmic Christ. 
He is one with the Father. He is the eternal word who has now taken on flesh and come to dwell among us, right? So you know that from the beginning as the reader, but then you keep reading through the next 20 chapters and you wait in vain for any character in the story to fully understand who Jesus is. The disciples, they constantly understand partially who Jesus is, but then they also don't really get it. Uh, The crowds, they can't really grasp who Jesus is. And so you're getting frustrated as the reader. By chapter 20, you're wondering, will any character in the gospel finally realize the totality, the fullness of who Jesus is? And then you get to chapter 20, our passage, and you realize it's Thomas. Thomas is the one. Thomas encounters the risen Lord Jesus, and he exclaims in verse 28, my Lord and my God. This is the most full-hearted confession of faith that you'll find anywhere in the whole gospel of John. And it's on the lips of the man we call doubting Thomas, right? My Lord and my God. And what's so significant about this phrase is, again, it serves as a template for what true faith looks like. What does it mean to put your faith in Jesus? Well, it means you have to know him as both. He has to be my Lord and he has to be my God. So taking them in reverse order, first, my God. To know Jesus as my God means that Jesus isn't just a a moral teacher. He isn't just a wise person who came to reveal to humanity the path to a good life. The gospel of John will have none of this. Authentic faith is rather to encounter Jesus, to see that he is one with the creator who made all things, And it is to fall down on your knees and worship him, not to celebrate him as a moral teacher, but to bow down to him as the alpha and the omega, the one who was and is and is to come. And then second, my Lord. So Lord, the Greek word here, kurios, means king. To put your faith in Jesus is to know him as king, as sovereign. True faith involves not only conceding that Jesus is God, it also, you know, in in an impersonal way, you you can believe in God in kind of a distant, removed way. But to know Jesus as king is to say, no, he is enthroned over my life. He is the Lord of my life. He's not the co-pilot of my life. He's not my daily inspiration. I bow down before him. I'm his subject and I submit my whole life to him because he is my king. What, What becomes of Thomas after our passage? We don't really know too much. Scripture doesn't tell us much about the rest of Thomas's life after this scene. But there are sources in church history that actually tell us a little bit about his life. So we're told in some early church sources that Thomas carried the gospel to India. He was the first missionary uh, to the Asian continent. And there he established a Christian community that is still in existence today. I actually know somebody with the last name Thomas, uh, a friend who's Indian, who they trace their family lineage back to the legacy of the apostle Thomas in India. And we're told that ultimately he was martyred for Christ while he was sharing the gospel there. So Thomas may have begun life as a doubter, but he dies as a saint and he dies as a hero of the faith. So so in closing, you know, the message today is that Thomas teaches us about death, doubt. Yes, he's he's a cautionary tale, what not to do with doubt in a lot of ways. But he also teaches us about faith, right? My Lord and my God, encountering the risen Lord and then submitting his whole life to that, to the point of missions and evangelism and martyrdom. That is a template for faith. That is a template of, like C.S. Lewis, a life that is turned upside down for Christ and is lived then to his glory. I want to close this morning by um, just sharing some of the words from a hymn that we sing in in our church that we love, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Uh, I'm sure some of you know the song and hopefully appreciate it. But this this hymn that we sing, especially around Easter time, uh, there are words in it from the perspective of Thomas. And they point point us towards Jesus. And so let me close this way. Uh, In this song, we sing, Crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands and side. Rich wounds yet visible above. Now in beauty glorified. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Let me pray for us.